Okay, hello. Um, today is the March 20, 2023, and uh, we welcome you uh, to today's Open Lab seminar at the Kudan Lab, where we have uh, Dustin Stoltz, who is, uh, contrary to our website, a third year assistant professor at Lehigh University. For those who have not heard about that place, it's a um, small or medium-sized fine uh, university in Pennsylvania, which um, is should be more well-known outside of the US. <laughs> uh, it's a pretty cool place. Check it out. Great campus, great work. Uh, awesome people coming out of it. And um, so today, Dustin will talk about uh, finding the body and sound in word embeddings. And uh, the slides are already on um, the screen. So uh, Dustin, uh, you can introduce a little bit more detail yourself and just take it from here. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks so much. Um, so yeah, so I'm a sister professor um, at Lehigh University and I am in the sociology department and I'm also in the cognitive science department. So my work kind of works at this interdisciplinary world. And I also do a lot of computational text analysis and this study, or the the presentation I'm going to talk or talk you through today, it has a sort of a theoretical component that I've been working on. Um, it has a, some methodological stuff that um, you may or may not be already familiar with, um, and then uh, two sort of empirical projects that I have been working on. So still kind of uh, kind of nascent, kind of early stuff that I've been working on that that sort of builds on these these two ideas that I've been uh, working through. So. In the discussion, you know, uh, feel free to to pick up on 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 any of those. Um, so uh, to get started, my uh, my sort of theoretical uh, thread here is thinking about this question of of arbitrariness because I I find you find this a lot in in text analysis. You find this a lot in cultural analysis. This idea that uh, we can analyze some sort of a cultural system as if it's autonomous, and the reason that we can do that is because meaning is arbitrary. It has no motivation or relation to the perceptible world. It's sort of severed from it, um, and that gives us license to sort of ignore you know, the, the, whatever is outside of what we're, we're analyzing, right? So either words are, are uh, arbitrary, right? They only gain meaning in relation to other words, um, right? Language is sort of a prison house, right? So, sort of contained. Um, so I well, want to sort of push back on this idea or challenge this idea. Um, and I think that one reason that people say that meaning is arbitrary, they really want to say that it's relational or it's conventional, right, in the sense that um, words mean things in relation to other things, um, or that it's conventional in the sense of uh, without without sort of human intervention, of selecting certain um, ways of conveying meaning, right, the meanings wouldn't be there without us. Um, but I think that another way of thinking about this is not to just assume that meaning is then arbitrary, but to think in terms of this variation within constraint. So the perceptible world and our perception of the world and our ability, right, our sort of uh, biological, physiological capacity to engage with a world that is there, right, provides uh, uh, some constraints. And what I think is useful for us as cultural analysts um, is that there's sort of become handles that we can um, explore cultural uh, worlds with, right? We can we can um, understand that cultural elements are going to have these sort of patterns that are fairly regular, and that we can explore this idea of this variation within constraint, right? So cultural regularity sort of is an emergent property of the fact that there are some relatively invariant, right? So that this is obviously on on a, on a spectrum of there are certain things that are just there in the world. Um, that we encounter based on the way that our bodies are put together, for instance, gravity, right? We experience gravity and it becomes a resource for the way that we understand the world. And it's a resource that's fairly regular, um, you know, across various uh, uh, domains of life and, and places in the world. So specifically, I'm interested in this idea that this that the body itself is sort of a source domain, not just for the things that our bodies do, but also where we tend to think of as disembodied domains, things that are fairly abstract, um, tasks that we think of as sort of 
distance from distant from embodiment. So um, this idea comes back to um, one of uh, one of Emil Durkheim's uh, students, um, Hertz, when he was uh, interested in sort of the asymmetries in the body and the way that that becomes a resource for understanding morality. So the sort of slight um, uh, uh, statistical norm towards being right-handed, right, becomes a source for organizing asymmetries in the world. Right, so we um, see all these sorts of associations with the left and bad things and evil things, right, and the right with good things, right, and this is this is something that occurs all over the world. Um, so, right, so this is the basic idea that there's something about the way that we engage with the world, the sort of basic sensory motor patterns that we engage with, and that regularity that then becomes something that we share across human experience. Um, so, as another example, again, this idea of of, of gravity, of verticality. Um, so uh, Barry Schwartz, uh, uh, a sociologist, was working on uh, how whenever people talk about good things, they talk about things that are high up. Um, so we have the, the phrase taking the high road, um, not taking the low road, or having or a low blow is like something that's bad, whereas taking the high road is being a good person. Um, we have this idea of moving up in the world as being, um, you know, social mobility of moving, uh, you know, higher into a, a better, a better way of living. Um, we have notions of heaven as being up and, and hell as being down. So all of this mapping of morality to verticality. So this basic sense of patterns, basic understanding of the world that emerges from our body and, and some, and some relatively invariant practices. Um, so Schwartz in particular argued that it comes from the fact that when we are babies, uh, we are picked up. And when we are picked up, we are given warmth and we are given food. And when we are put down, we sort of, we don't have that. Um, and so as a baby, it's one of the very first things that we learn is that moving up is a good thing. Um, and then at the same time, when we are young children, uh, the people in our lives who are bigger than us are also more powerful than us and tell us what to do. So that sort of reinforces this notion of things that are above us have higher authority are more powerful or wealthier and, and so on. So it becomes a basic metaphor for understanding uh, morality and a basic metaphor for understanding inequality. Um, as another example, so this comes from uh, the linguist George Lakoff and the philosopher Mark Johnson in uh, the really you know, well-known book, Metaphors We Live By, but it's that we cannot understand time, which is fundamentally abstract without uh, under sort of realizing it in terms of another metaphor, and perhaps the most pervasive metaphor is space. So we understand time only as, as some kind of a movement within a space. So time, either time is a moving object. Um, so we're sort of standing still and time is moving towards us or away from us, or we're moving through time. So time is stationary and we are the thing that's moving through time. Um, and we, you know, a lot of, uh, 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 they, you know, they put together a lot of phrases uh, to show that it's really hard to talk about time without talking about it being somewhere. Um, and uh, right, yeah. So what's, but what's interesting about this particular metaphor is that this doesn't mean that there's sort of a naive realism to this in the sense of just the world's there and then we internalize it. And then that's just the way that meaning works, right? There's this variation within this constraint. So the Aymara, for instance, in South America, really interesting group of people, they, um, whereas most people um, in uh, where this has been studied around the world, see the future as in front and the past as behind, the, the Amara have it the other way around where the future is actually behind them and the past is in front of them and the present is sort of immediate. And this is not just linguistic, it's also gestural. So when they're gesturing about planning, um, it's sort of uh, baked into their gestures of, of where time um, where time is in relation to them, right? And this is also based on a grounded metaphor, an embodied metaphor, which is that to know things is to see things. And this is because they have just experienced the past. So it is therefore in front of them. It's something they can see, but since they have not experienced the future, it's behind them.
right? So these all these these different um, um, scholars have really sort of converged on this idea that something that can uh, sort of provide a grounding to symbolic to cultural systems, right, is the body and our experience of the relatively invariant perceptual patterns in the world. So um, I would argue, right, that, that the body is a relatively stable anchor, and it's a relatively stable anchor across time, place, and person, which provides a really good um, point of access when we're thinking about cultural comparisons. Because if there's something that's relatively stable, then we can really see the ways that people differ um, in relation to that sort of anchor, that lodestone. So how does this relate to words? So fairly uh, famously, uh, the, philo or the, uh, the linguist Fernandez Saussure argued that the relation between the things we say, the, the phonemes, the words that we say, and what they mean is arbitrary. And he was making this argument because he really just wanted to not really deal with the problem of meaning. So he was trying to sever that off and just focus on sound, really just understand sound change. And uh, in uh, his, his, uh, his lecture notes, he argued one possible um, argument against this observation is the notion of onomatopoeia, which are you know, words that sort of sound like what they are. But he sort of uh, very quickly just says, "Nah, eh, it's not like there. There's not that many of them. They're relatively, uh, you know, they're relatively few, and they're still kind of they're still kind of conventional and arbitrary. So I don't really think that that's evidence against uh, my argument. Um, but we now know that there's actually fairly pervasive sound symbolism in language. <clears throat> so one example is um, the the phonos themes. So phonos themes are um, short phonemes that are it, uh, very consistently applied to words that have a very consistent meaning. Um, so the uh, in English, we have the, the FL sound, which expresses some kind of movement. So here's just a, a, a sample list. I think somewhere that there's over a hundred uh, words that have this. Another one is the SN phoneme, which is often associated with the nose. So it's really showing that there actually is a consistent uh, relationship between some of the sounds that we're using to put words together and the meanings that they convey with enough regularity that we should be a little skeptical of this idea that there's absolutely no connection between sound and meaning. Um, so another example, probably a little bit more famous than Phonos themes is, or, uh, in general is this idea of the Bobo Kiki effect um, which is you can make up a fake word and tell people to associate it with, for instance, an abstract shape, and there's relative consistency across people. And they've even found this uh, uh, in uh, multilingual settings. And even um, sort of uh, uh, one of the criticisms was that there's a relationship between the writing, right? That the the way that the words look sort of is, is being associated with... Um, with their with their meanings or associations with the abstract shapes, um, but uh, they found that regardless of what people what uh, sort of writing system or script people are using, um, they really are associating the sound with the abstract shape. So there really is this mapping of sound to sort of perceptual um, attributes. So we really are right. We're finding that the body plays a, a, an important role in organizing meaning systems. We're finding that there is sound sim symbolism. So there really is um, at least less arbitrariness in language than what, for instance, Saussure uh, presumed. So there's this on uh, this non-arbitrary mapping of sound and meaning, and this cross-modal mapping of meaning and perception. Right. So. We can see things, we can hear things, and we can associate them as being sort of perceptually similar. <clears throat> so that's sort of the theoretical aspect of what I've uh, been working on is sort of how can we take these insights and bring them to this world of, of, of word embeddings, which I'll get into in a moment if you're not familiar, but it really focuses specifically on text, right? In many cases, we don't really have access to um, anything else that's going on, we really are just focusing on 
um, the the words themselves and the relationship between the words, the co-occurrences of the words. So my uh, so what I'm wondering with this is, can we sort of recover or bring out or extract um, these regularities that we would assume are there um, based on the sort of embodiment of meaning? And I'm going to explore that and kind of uh, share with you two uh, uh, pieces that I'm, I've been working on. Um, one is going to be about this idea of occupational prestige, and then another about song similarities. So I'll start with the, the occupational prestige. <clears throat> so uh, sort of a bread and butter uh, piece of uh, literature in, in my home field of sociology is this idea of occupational prestige and this idea that occupations, which are um, you know, quite different, can be ordered along a dimension of prestige. Right? And this work started um, in the in the 1940s with they you know just surveyed people and they asked them to rank different occupational titles by prestige. Um, and this was sort of picked up um, later on in uh, the GSS, the long, longest running representative survey in the United States. It has been continually working with occupational prestige scores. And then the most recent ones, the ones that I will be using today are based on the 2012 occupational prestige scores, which have also been replicated right around the world. And uh, that's, yeah, so what's really fascinating about occupational prestige scores is that they are remarkably robust, that you can ask people, um, to rank different occupational titles in a variety of different ways. You can ask different populations. Uh, you can ask a lot of people, you can ask few people. Um, and there, there is some variation over time and place, but they are remarkably consistent, right? There is some important variation and people have been exploring sort of the edges of this and trying to understand why there is this variation, but precisely because there is this remarkable consistency for this task, All right? So one um, early study of this found that, um, you know, uh, in, a, in, a, in about a two decade span, there was almost a perfect correlation in occupational scores, you know, at least in the United States. And then in a recent uh, attempt to do this uh, globally, they found again, remarkably high correlation in how people rank different occupations. So uh, it's possible. So one possibility is that, you know, people are simply just, they're sort of internalizing it. Um, you know, they just know that they're, you know, that they're, that medical doctors go here and janitors go here, right? And there's just this memorization going on at some point, um, you know, maybe perhaps as part of, um, you know, the modernization of and globalization of education or something like that. But we even find remarkable consistency within um, specialties, for instance, the difference between a heart doctor and a foot doctor, right, a cardiologist and a podiatrist, that people will be remarkably consistent in ranking even within these really fine-grained um, occupations. And it's very unlikely that humans are memorizing this level of granularity, because this is simply not really what the way that the mind works, that we tend to, um, the brain uh, is is much more about efficiency than accuracy. And uh, the idea that they're sort of internalizing this huge complex understanding of prestige scores, um, it's just very unlikely. So what this really gets at and how this comes back to the idea of word embeddings and arbitrariness uh, is that what we are asking people to do in these tasks is asking them what the meaning of the word is. What is the meaning of a janitor? What is the meaning of a medical doctor? You know, what is the meaning of a politician? And generally speaking, we have sort of two ways we can think about what words mean. So we have the classic definitions, which is that words have a sort of single meaning. They can be summarized. Uh, you can just ask somebody what the definition is and they can give it to you and it should be fairly consistent. Um, and perhaps there are homonyms, um, but for the most part, words just, they have, they have the definition that's sort of in a dictionary uh, and that's that, right? I think as social scientists, we tend to be sort of skeptical of this notion. 
And our general approach to thinking about word meanings aligns with this idea of frame semantics that comes from the linguist Charles Fillmore, which is that words, right, sort of activate a network of meanings. They're sort of connected. They are relational. And that they have many possible potentials, right, of variation within that, within a certain range. And so some of their meanings, right, form a more cent are more central, but then they have these sort of peripheral meanings as well. And so this idea um, can be found in the linguist uh, Leonard Bloomfield, um, sort of almost a contemporary of Saussure um, and also a structuralist, but I think a, a, a better source for linguistic structuralism in my opinion. All right, but there's this idea that yes, okay, words, they do kind of have a meaning, but it's sort of fuzzy, right? It's sort of is moving in a space and it's along various dimensions that these uh, this movement falls. So, Building on this idea that words have a little bit more complex meaning than just a single definition, how do we go about getting a word's meaning? So obviously we can ask people. And uh, the way that this tends to go is we get a set of words. So we get some words that we would like um, people to rate along these specific dimensions that we're interested in. So perhaps most uh, sort of famously, you have the sentiment dictionaries. Uh, the very first sentiment dictionary I was able to find was by Charles Mosier, um, 1941, but maybe maybe it came before. Um, but it was just they uh, he uh, gave people a, a word and we and he asked them to rank on a scale of one to eleven on favorableness. Um, but that's a you know that's a sentiment dictionary. We ask people uh, to uh, align words along a single dimension of sentiment from positive to negative. And then what we do is we take those those ratings and, you know, perhaps we get a mean or median and that's sort of the norm of that word. And so there's a, a you know, whole area of literature in linguistics on word norms. And these are essentially hand weighted dictionaries along particular dimensions. Um, so there are lots and lots of, of hand weighted dictionaries out there. Um, again, uh, probably most well known is sentiment analysis um, or the Luke dictionaries. Um, the ones that I've been working with and most fascinated by are the Lancaster Sensory Motor Norms Dictionaries, which rank words along different bodily dimensions, right? So how associated is this word with, um, the, with the hands, with the arms, with the legs, with the torso, with the head, but also the, the uh, perceptual modality. So how associated is this word with vision, with hearing, with tasting, with smelling, and so on? So there's been lots of really, uh, uh, you know, good inv advances in hand-weighted dictionaries, these norm dictionaries, uh, you know, over the last 50, 60 years. One is that, you know, earlier they they mostly um, used categorical um, rankings. So they didn't get that, this idea that meaning is continuous, right? So it was more, is this word positive or is this word negative? Is this word associated with the head or not? And they've also been exploring this idea of multidimensionality. So in the case of the Lancaster Sensory Motor Norms Dictionary, right? You have these, these multiple modalities. So a word can be associated with the head and the hands. Um, and then the dictionaries have been growing a, a lot. So the earlier dictionaries I've been able to find um, are a few hundred words, whereas the Lancaster Sensory Motor Norms Dictionary is 40,000 words. So that's a good, you know, that's a good number of words. But these dictionaries have uh, downsides. One uh, is that they're they're sort of rigid. Once you've created them, right, you really can't uh, change them. You'd have to kind of go back to the beginning, and they're resource intensive. So the um, the Lancaster Dictionary um, costs about three thousand dollars, three thousand U.S. dollars to uh, um, to create, which you know not every uh, uh, scholar has that that chunk lying around if they have an idea for okay, do words fall along this particular dimension? They can't just go back. And, uh, and, and recreate this study uh, very easily. And then the other problem is that fundamentally in order to do this, you have to start with the words that you want to use later. And typically um, these scholars start with just really frequent words, right? They get a very large corpus and they find uh, the most frequent words and they do, a, you know, they kind of cut off and then they use those most frequent words. But very often, the words that we want when we're doing our studies are, are not there. So a lot of the occupational titles 
that I'm interested in are simply not in the dictionary, even though it's a 40,000 word dictionary. So for example, um, if we were just looking at some, you know, just a, a random sample of, uh, of academic titles, right? My sociologist would not make it, right? So they'd be at the cutoff at 40,000. Um, uh, so, right, so, so very, uh, um, yeah, so very often the words that we're really interested in or the words that are specific to our particular domain that we're exploring are simply not going to be in these dictionaries. So then the other way that we go about getting what words mean is we're going to just observe how people use the word. So this is a very sort of uh, goes back to at least, you know, Wittgenstein, this idea that that words that people know what words mean, and they use the words to do things based on what those mean. And so we can find evidence of the meanings based on how people are using them, right? So we're sort of seeing this echo of meaning um, in word usages. So the idea here, right, is to find a way of summarizing those, those contexts of use, how people are using them in some particular way. So how we go about doing that, right? We get a very, very large corpus and we basically count each time a word occurs with another word within some kind of a window, say five words on either side. Uh, and this creates a term context matrix, a TCM. And basically once we summarize the information in that TCM, we have what is conventionally called a word embedding. So, um, you know, most word embedding uh, techniques that are out there, they implicitly or explicitly, this is what they're doing. They're basically summarizing. Um, they're trying to find some kind of a summary matrix or matrices in terms of multiple layers that are trying to predict, right, these co-occurrence statistics in the TCM. So that's the basic idea behind word embeddings. So <clears throat> um, the word embeddings that I'll be using today, right, they use a very large training corpus called the common crawl, which is basically a huge collection of, of the, the internet. Um, and it, the way that I understand it is that it's getting at the norms, right, of, of essentially English language, right? And of course, there's some uh, loss of accuracy with that. But I think, um, generally speaking, uh, we can we can conclude that it is getting at the basic norms or estimating the basic norms in a way very similar to what we would get if we were to survey people about what these words mean. So once we have those embeddings, right, we essentially each word has a vector representation, um, right, in that, in that reduced, in that summarized uh, matrix of the TCM. And we can take that matrix and think of it as a space. And when we think of it as a space, we think of meaning as continuous and words are locations in that continuous meaning space. And essentially it's neighbors are words that tend to be used in similar contexts. And this can be, they're literally used in the same context, right? They're sort of sequential or they're words that are substitutable. Um, they tend to be used in the same context but they're not necessarily used together. And then we can measure that neighborhood, right? That distance using cosines, right? So the angle between the two vectors. So here's a very simple two-dimensional representation of that, right? So we have a few different words. Um, we can measure the distance between, um, you know, the sport of bowling and the word rich, which is uh, because bowling tends to be associated with sort of work as a working class sport, it's gonna be further away from rich. Tennis tends to be associated with a more wealthier sport, so it's going to be closer to rich, right? So this is a basic two-dimensional um, uh, understanding of what's going on. So what's really, I think, fascinating about these basic embeddings, um, you know, is that we can take this single representation of context, but then we can really, uh, with uh, with just uh, computational efficiency, uh, fine tune that space in a way that can get at more detailed context. And one way we can do that with this idea of the centroid, which is that rich 
uh, is a word that could mean like that something has a lot of flavor, right? The flavor is really rich, uh, but it can also be associated with wealth. And so we might want to uh, make sure that we're getting at that, that wealthy dimension, right? That wealthy aspect of rich, as opposed to this lots of flavor. And one way we can do that is by averaging vectors with, a, with several words that are associated with this idea of rich as wealthy. So rich, money, wealthy, we can sort of average those together. And this gives us a better approximation of the meaning that we are interested in, right? And it's building on this, again, this idea that meaning is continuous and that words just happen to be points in that continuous space. <clears throat> the other thing we can do is we can create dimensions. Um, we can create spectrums, which help us sort of pin down the way that we are comparing distances. And this gets us much closer to the idea of a hand-weighted dictionary, right? So we subtract one of the centroids from the other. And so, for example, if we um, subtract poor from rich, right, if we sort of average those words and we subtract the two, we're going to get a direction. Right, and this helps us create a, a sense of meaningful juxtapositions. So here's an example of if we're trying to create a direction pointing towards affluence and away from poverty, um, these are some of the words that we would sort of average the columns together and subtract one from the other, and it gives us this direction. Right, so going back to our two-dimensional representation, this is with just the basic centroids, but then here's what the direction, we sort of summarized this juxtaposition. Um, now, the, 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 the example is only in two dimensions, but obviously we're dealing with um, word embeddings, which tend to be um, hundreds of dimensions. And so we get a lot of really interesting relationships precisely because once you get above three dimensions, uh, spatial distance is no longer transitive. So just because A is close to B, and B is close to A doesn't mean, or sorry, yeah, A is close to B and B is close to C. It doesn't mean that C is, is by definition close to A because of this really interesting um, spatial relationships that exist in high dimensions. So <clears throat> the other thing that's really fascinating, like in addition to this ability to fine tune these embedding spaces uh, for our particular uh, domains that we're interested in is that we get unlimited directions in centroids, right? We're really sort of uh, restricted by our own imaginations and of course the way that meanings actually um, exist in our corpus. Um, but this doesn't, right? If we have a new idea of a dimension that we might be interested in exploring, we don't have to get $3,000 to get uh, some people to rank them, um, rank our words along that dimension. We can sort of use these embedding spaces uh, to do that for us. And so one example that's, again, super well-known is this idea of a gender bias direction where we can rank words as being how are they more associated with masculine as opposed to feminine. <clears throat> and so to sort of summarize, right, uh, what's great about word embeddings, they really get at this idea of word meanings in terms of frame semantics with this idea that meaning is continuous. They're inherently multidimensional. Um, they tend to be less re resource intensive, right? Once we've trained them, we can really reuse them uh, for lots of really great things. And they also very easily, uh, we can create massive vocabularies. So while 40,000 word hand-weighted dictionary is quite a feat, um, you know, getting one to two million word uh, embeddings is not, is not so difficult. So, So going back to the question at hand, this idea that when we ask people to rank occupations by prestige, we're really asking them what do words mean? And one way we can understand the meaning of words and why people are really consistent at ranking them, right, is how they relate to the body. And so to measure how occupations relate to the body, um, here I have created directions in an embedding space. One is from the head to the hands, and then I've created centroids for the, the visual, the olfactory, the auditory, and the gustatory modalities. And the idea here is, is there an association between the way that people are ranking these prestige scores and how these words tend to be associated with the body, 
right? Does the body become a way of sort of organizing that task itself of ranking people, um, ranking occupations by prestige? So, uh, so for loci, I'm going to use semantic directions and for modalities, I'm using semantic centroids. And then I measure the cosine distance between each occupational label, right? And these, these summary measures in the embedding space. <clears throat> yeah. So the question that I'll be uh, looking at just with uh, three, three analyses that I'll be presenting is first, is loci or modalities predictive of occupational prestige? Um, are they predictive of subjective work outcomes? And then are they predictive of spouse's occupational prestige? So uh, here is uh, just the, the, uh, the density of each of the measures. So we can see here that the, the cosine distance between occupational um, labels and for instance, head and hand are relatively normally distributed. So we see a nice distribution that doesn't require uh, complex modeling to deal with. Um, and here's just the, um, <clears throat> the basic uh, uh, bivariate associations. So the first thing that we can see is that there is a very strong relationship between an occupational label being associated with the head and prestige. But what's really fascinating is when we get into the specific modalities, we see that all of them are negative. So there's this idea that the um, that the the body itself or it becomes uh, it, uh, the more associated an occupation is with particular modalities, right? The less prestigious we tend to see it as, right? So there's this there is this idea at least um, in the popular imagination that uh, the disembodied, more abstract things tend to be uh, more um, prestigious. <clears throat> So uh, the first model I'll be showing is using the, the general social survey, and it's using uh, recent uh, uh, six waves, so the 2008 to 2018, which roughly aligns to when the word embeddings were created. And so I pool uh, occupations, um, and so I get the percent uh, white versus non-white, the percent female versus male, and then the average years of education, the average income. <clears throat> so the unit of analysis here is the occupation itself. Um, and here's a little bit more about the model specifications. And so I'm just using sort of bread and butter OLS, um, and I estimate two separate models. So one that includes the loci, so the head to the hands, and then one that includes all the modalities. And then what I'll be presenting are the average marginal effects. So on the uh, on the left hand at the bottom, you'll see the estimate for the for the loci from the head uh, or yeah toward the head and from the hands, and you can see that there is a, a significant effect that there's a, a fairly strong association, um, roughly equivalent to a year of education, um, so a year or more of education. Um, and again, this is controlling for things like race, gender, and income of the occupation. On the right-hand side, um, we can see that, um, that the gustatory and the visual are the modalities with uh, the signif significant differences. So we can see that occupations that are associated with the gustatory uh, modality are considerably less prestigious and then those associated with the visual modality are considerably more prestigious and again, roughly on the order of a year of education. <clears throat> right, so to summarize, we see this, this higher occupational prestige if the locus is in the head and it's associated with the visual modality, and we see lower occupational prestige if it's associated with the hands or the gustatory system. So, I was also interested in whether or not the sort of embodiment of an occupation was predictive of different forms of, uh, of sort of job satisfaction or, or feelings um, uh, that they have towards their work under the understanding that, uh, uh, that if one has a higher uh, prestige or a more prestigious jobs that they'll sort of feel um, better about their job. Um, so again, here's sort of some model specifications. 
the unit of analysis here is the respondent. So about 15,000 respondents um, over the, uh, the, the six waves. And the outcome variables are binary, so I'll be using logistic regression. So estimating four different models, right? So one for, are you satisfied with your job? Are you not satisfied with your job? Do you feel respect at work? And do you not feel respect at work? So, <clears throat> um, so these are the two outcome variables um, and the loci. So we see at the bottom that um, people who uh, have jobs that are associated with the head uh, tend to be more satisfied with their job. Um, and this is a, a larger effect than a year of education. Surprisingly, those who have a job associated with the head also feel less respect at work, which is a really interesting finding that I've been thinking about for a while. <clears throat> Um, let's see. And then, yeah. And so uh, uh, this is uh, the, the modalities and the same sort of questions. So we see that um, the those who have jobs associated with the olfactory and the gustatory tend to have lower job satisfaction. Um, and then those who have a job associated with the visual modality tend to feel very respected at work as opposed to those with auditory and gustatory. So again, to summarize, those with higher job satisfaction tend to have jobs associated with the head and not associated with the olfactory or gustatory. Those with higher respect at work, um, they surprisingly tend to have jobs associated with, or who feel more respect at work, have jobs associated with the hands, um, but are also associated with the visual modality. So the final analysis in this particular study, I was interested in the relationship between um, the respondent's occupation, sort of the embodiment of the respondent's occupation, and whether it was predictive of a spouse's occupational prestige, right? Essentially, is there um, homogamy in this in this association between jobs and sort of their embodiment um, and the understanding of, of jobs as they relate to embodiment and who people tend to be married to? Um, so for this, I'm using a, a different uh, survey, or it's a really great survey we have in the United States. Uh, the Community Population Survey, um, which gives really good uh, household level uh, information. And in particular, we usually get information on both, um, uh, on everyone in a household, so we can look at homogamy. So again, model specification information. Um, here again, using bread and butter OLS, uh, the unit of analysis is 100,000 respondents and then their spouses. Um, and this is subset because spouses need to both be employed in order to, uh, to predict spouses' uh, prestige. And then again, I'm going to predict or uh, do two separate models, one for loci and one for the modalities. <clears throat> so um, on the, the left hand is the, the model for modality. We see a very, very strong effect that... Um, a spouse, a, a respondent having a job associated with the head is highly predictive of the spouse having a higher prestige um, job. In fact, it's one of the highest uh, predictors among any of the variables in the model. <clears throat> and then when we move to the uh, perceptual modalities, we see that uh, a respondent having a job associated with the olfactory is very predictive of a spouse with a low prestige job, whereas a respondent having a job associated with the visual modality is very predictive of a spouse having a high prestige job, as well as with the auditory. So again, to summarize. Right, so, so essentially we see that there's the possibility that the way that we're understanding this notion of prestige and the ability of people to do what is essentially a very abstract task um, is potentially coming from this notion that um, the body is a source domain for understanding the way that the world is organized. And one of the ways that the world may be organized is the way that we value different uses of the body. 
and thus the occupations that we associate uh, with those uh, uses of the body. So the idea here is that there is sort of a basic evaluative structure that, uh, right, that high status is given to occupations associated with the head and the visual modality. And so it's therefore possible that if we were to move into a different domain, to move outside of, of occupations in particular, that we might find this basic embodied evaluative structure in multiple domains of life, um, right, which is obviously a place that I would eventually like to go. So that is the that is the first um, that is the first study um, that uh, that uh, I've been I've been working on and kind of exploring this idea of embodiment using um, embeddings. Do you, should you, should we take questions in between or? I think that yeah, they're, these are very different. So I think uh, it would be it would be really cool if uh, uh, we could we could talk about it. Yes. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, Mila Oiva. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. This is this is super interesting and um, kind of like uh, I think this approach of of um, this embodied cognition is is very interesting and very new to me also. So, um, so actually, uh, I had two questions, if I may. Um, mm -hmm. So first of all, as a, my background is in cultural history and um, I have been thinking a lot kind of like how does text in general um, tell about, you know, the past that we are studying and, and, uh, and how about uh, kind of uh, like other practices that people do, for example, to make my point maybe more clear is that um, once I was studying um, like uh, people doing advertising in Poland and um, it was interesting to see that when certain advertising practices seem to become more prevailing people the the kind, kind of like be people didn't talk about these <clears throat> these things anymore so much so kind of like uh, as a sociologist how do you see that uh, how how do you see the relationship between a text that people talk about these um, occupations and occupational kind of like uh, prestige and how is it connected to um, real life or in practice this um, occupational uh, prestige uh, in relation to you know how much people are paid how much uh, you know how you know how much people want to study this particular topic or, or discipline in order to become you know these kinds of things so that's kind of like one of the mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. this is kind of like a really huge question i understand but but this is what i started to think and also i was um maybe i didn't really fully understand because this um embodiment of of uh, languages is a new topic to me but um um i'm kind of like um can you please explain a little bit more um how does a studying um embodiments uh, of occupations and and their relations with uh, so different modalities um, uh, how, how does it uh, help us to understand better, um, like working life or or prestige? And is it is there a connection between also kind of um, uh, different modalities of of uh, kind of like how um, occupations might be might have. Um, different categories of prestige, meaning some occupations are better, better paid than others, while some other occupations, people might think that they are not as well paid, but the, you know, the topic, what they are doing is, is very interesting, or, or in certain occupations, there is more stable uh, positions, while in others, so kind of like, is it related to these kind of like different um, uh, different ways of valuing um, uh, occupations. Yeah, sorry, huge questions, but yeah, you know, yeah. it's super interesting. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, so two really big questions. So I, I think your first question is kind of getting at this idea of 
of people not talking about things versus talking about things and and that sometimes people will it will write right yeah so because we only have access to text in the past unfortunately right <laughs> um so people are writing about a lot of things and there's sort of things going on in the background and i think this is actually a really interesting area that we need to explore more is this relationship between frequency and what we're seeing in the embeddings and people are people are definitely doing that where they see that the there are these strong associations are sort of being pushed by um by just people talking a lot about a particular thing um and i i uh, this is like it's sort of in my mind constantly and I don't have a good um, uh, notion of it but I do think that there's something can be gained from thinking from thinking that comes from network theory which is how can we think about the absences um, in when we move from you know networks to to spaces and so thinking about these two kinds of structures can we learn something from what you know uh, so structural holes theory for instance really we learned a ton about how social networks worth by thinking about the absences. And I think that's something we can potentially use in this new uh, way of thinking about meaning in terms of spaces. Right, I don't have the key and, you know, but it's, it's something in my mind and it's a really, really good question. Um, yeah, the, the, other, the, the other question, it's definitely, again, this is something that I'm thinking about and pushing forward. And one um, example that comes to mind is the relationship between verticality and morality. Um, and that is that we have a very strong association around the world with with how tall people are um, and how much they make, right? So there's a premium that people get just for being an inch taller, right? Um, and this is sort of something that's that's found all around the world that they get this little boost um, uh, when you control for other things just for being a little bit taller. And it's because I would argue because of the basic this a basic evaluative bias that we have with. Um, with things that are that are vertical, which things that are above, things that are high, and goodness, um, powerfulness, um, you know, so all of these sort of positive associations that we have between different things. And I feel like we see this generally in the occupational structure as it relates to the basic, what I call the basic embodied evaluative structure, which is that things that are associated with the head and seen are going to get this tiny little positive bias. But that being said, I do think that there are really interesting occupational projects. I think some social closure institutions, um, trade unions, or um, professional associations can engage in really fascinating projects where they push against those um, th that basic evaluative structure. Uh, but I think it's sort of an it is a it is an ongoing project that they that they sort of have to invest resources in it to try and create that. And so. I think that there are really fascinating moments where we get these mythologized occupations, which sort of stand above other occupations of their same. In the United States, we have um, like the coal miner is sort of it's there's not that many coal miners left in the United States, but they're sort of mythologized in a way because they serve this sort of political agenda um, and they have a, you know, an organizational apparatus behind them to try and try and boost their prestige. So that would be my my theory that when we do see these basic deviations from what I would call the basic embodied evaluative structure, it's because we have these interesting sort of um, historical organizational projects to, to sort of boost certain um, occupations prestige. But that's, that's speculation. Nice. We got quite a line of people going on. Um, I, I, can, you, can you please, before we go on with uh, the next question, specify a little bit, because you, you've done this a second time, basically with this hate uh, association, uh, mm -hmm. you, you, you came up with an argument. And in a similar way, you actually cited, um, who was it, um, Hertz, uh, regarding this slight physiological advantage of the right hand, which is yeah. obviously, you know, it's like, if, if, this, if this was like a gender difference, this would be misogynic. Um, there is both-handed people, there's left-handed people, and if you're in the wrong side of the half pipe, your right hand doesn't help you at all in the air. Uh, mm -hmm. So the question is, in how much are these sort of, um, I, I think the work you do is super, super interesting. But then in these kind of situations where you come up with these sort of explanations, you know, tall people, in order to be tall, tall you need more food. You can see this in many countries. This is something you didn't say. And in some sense, the argument you bring reminds me of archaeology, where you know you, you find some stuff and you make up an explanation. And if the audience doesn't say no, 
uh, you get away with it. But the question is, <laughs> is it really true? And can we really actually sort of like uh, say it that way? Uh, is there a slight physiological advantage of the right hand? I would say no. Is there uh, is is what you say about being tall true, or is it just a convention that is arbitrarily made up to be right in your focus? <laughs> so, so so how how do you think is like do we get around this? Can we can we get rid of these kind of explanations? Um, maybe with your method. It's a oh, that's question. a question. I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're really really throwing some good ones at me. <clears throat> Oh, basically, what, you, what uh, I'm sorry uh, to interrupt you. Basically, what you are saying, at least in terms of uh, in terms of heat, mm -hmm. is it is not at all clear where in what direction the causation goes. That maybe people who are uh, paid more are taller because it brings them more food, and because it, and it might be related with this 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 hereditary. The transition of the state. Uh, so, is it uh, being paid more for, for, for being uh, taller? Is it the reason it goes one way around or another way around? Uh, that is sort of the question which would be interesting. Yeah. I don't, yeah, sorry, I don't know if I quite caught all that. <laughs> <laughs> If we, we don't, maybe we just should state it. So the key, the key, uh, there is an issue, right? We, we we make these observations, but causality is indeed right. really, really difficult. And our, yeah. we should be very cautious with using intuition in any kind of way. Oh, yeah, yeah, abso absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, and this is, again, I think uh, in terms of my specific uh, um, studies that I'm working on, these are very early in the process and, and me sort of thinking about these. But I also think it's important that um, you know I'm relying on people work that has come before me. I think the the height association is you know is incredibly you know well studied by a lot of different people you know in psychology, in economics, in sociology, um, and so you know I think at, on on some sense we are we are taking on faith our sort of colleagues in the scientific community. <laughs> But I think the the issue of causality is you know it's always uh, it's always going to be an issue um, to consider, and I don't know if I have a good question offhand, but I will probably be thinking about that for the rest of the day. <laughs> my 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 hunch, having been a professor in Texas, would be you know it's very different if you result on gender um, um, difference comes out of the University of Alabama or from a liberal arts college in downtown San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> so Mark Metz has the next question. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, okay, so I'll, uh, I think I'll cut it short with this, this one question, maybe. But no, actually, first of all, about the occupation of prestige, you said it's pretty stable. Uh, is it like stable both in the, you know, in the, uh, in a top and bottom and middle as well, actually, because sometimes it might be, you know, the worst and the best are stable, but actually the ones in the middle might be varying more. Um, yeah, is, is, is that your question or? Yeah, that's my first question, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah so, uh, so there, there, is, there is movement and variation. And so, like I said, there is people who are sort of exploring the, the places that it, it varies and so, there's some obvious things, for instance, people are better at ranking um, people who are sort of closer to them in the, you know, so doctors are, are more consistent about ranking other doctors than people who are not medical doctors. Um, and, uh, and generally speaking, the extremes, right, people are, are much, you know, better, or sorry, much more consistent at the extremes, right? But I think what's really fascinating is Right, that people are still fairly consistent, even when we get pretty fine grained and even in the middle. People are still reasonably consi more consistent than you'd expect. Um, you know, when you're studying, uh, you know. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I see. But, but the okay. The so bigger question was that I I I'd rather ask it now, uh, not in the in the end, but uh, about the. The method it, itself. So, so in, in the dictionary-based approach. So, like you know, it's, it's, there's like dictionary-based approaches, 
that you kind of compare to the text embeddings that you're doing. So in there, like, you know, you can easily come across this problem of this, you know, sort of <clears throat> orthogonal meanings that, uh, that like with the, uh, for example, example, the balance and the arousal that are uh, attached to the sort of the words. And so there's like, so the, the Peter thoughts and some, uh, there's some ideas that, you know, these are actually, some of these ideas are taken for granted. Uh, this sort of, you know, dimensions that, you know, balance the arousal, like certain dimensions, but actually they're like often overlapping and you can you can discern uh, you can find like some some ones that are much more uh, you know farther apart from each other like like for example the power and danger like something like that. So do you think this uh, uh, how, how does the does the same problem of uh, you know kind of distinguishing these overlapping dimensions of meaning does this sort of uh, embedding based approach uh, does it overcome it? because uh, there is still the problem of you know dimension reduction and so on so uh, is, is the question clear does it make sense um i think yeah i think there, there's a few different questions and there are a few different things to consider i think on, on one hand what i think it, that is really useful is if in fact somebody feels as though they would like to do a hand-weighted dictionary they you know they're more confident in the method it's been around longer um, one way of seeing whether or not you have a coherent dimension, which I think is one way of getting at what, what you're saying is, um, is, you know, is, is to use these methods of creating a direction and seeing whether or not, um, so one, one method of, of creating direction involves PCA, which was used in one of the sort of early gender bias, uh, um, papers. Right, and you can really see the extent to which a single dimension actually does summarize sort of the variation in um, in this direction. Right, really, you know, is gender one one dimensional or is gender you know two dimensional or three dimensional? Um, it seems that gender is actually sort of is it's and again, I would I would say it's like um, the way that I feel about occupational rankings being so consistent. What's really fascinating is gender is sort of unique in embedding research because it really does seem to be a one-dimensional sort of dimension in the space that's sort of organizing the space. It really does seem to be fairly consistent that you know cultures just tend to organize gender bias along a dimension, a single dimension, whereas you could get the sort of multi-dimensional spaces. Um, in terms of the sort of the extent to which uh, kind of the work of that comes from uh, uh, Osgood on on the sort of three dimension the, the three dimensions. I don't know. I don't know too much. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I would say about that. I do know, however, that uh, the people who are working on affect control theory, um, who are really excited about exactly what I'm what I'm talking about now, which is instead of building these dictionaries, we can use word embeddings. Right? They're really sort of exploring that, and so. Um, hopefully they will, uh, you know, uh, be, be the, the place to look to see if they can overcome, um, the issues that you talked about, but I don't know, I'd have to, I'd have to think about that a little bit more. Um, I'm not sure if, yeah, I'm not sure if, if I specifically answered your question. Uh, yeah, 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 like, yeah, like half of it and the other half is, yeah, I see that's, that's where the development will be going towards it. Yeah, it's worth checking what, what will, will happen in the field. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, they they specifically use those uh, those specific um, dimensions, um, and so yeah, I would, it, it, and they're excited about embedding. So I, you know, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that they're yeah. seeing some way that it can overcome them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Mikhail. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, thank you. It's very interesting. Thank you very much, and I'm mostly being a <laughs> well, from theory to background, that's clear to me in the end and absorbing what you have seen, but still, I have a couple of things. Well, apart from what we already discussed, a couple of things which I found a bit confusing, maybe me, minor things, which I wanted to go a little bit. Uh, one is about these honest stamps, which you mentioned, like things like words with full in, in them uh, invoking some sort of what you said some liquidity or something like this uh 
My question, question is basically whether it is, I mean, uh, the example you gave was obviously from English, which is which is just one language, and uh, and uh, there might be millions of uh, uh, millions of explanations why it, it, it might be some sort of uh, protein the European stem, which has this problem with something. Uh, is uh, anything known about uh, sort of cross language, especially cross different language groups? Uh, regularities of this sort. That is the first question. And another question, which was uh, um, which was uh, of purely mathematical nature. I am a little bit confused about what you said that dimensions larger than three, uh, the relation of being near is not transitive. I mean, I know the quality that the key is doing by dimensions as well. Uh, well, I have sort of an idea what you're talking about, but I have like the last question to remember it. And third thing, I cannot help but react to what Max said, uh, which is basically that I don't think to say that majority of people are right handed. Is in any way ableist or or it simply it simply is the case and the, and, and the problems left-handed people have uh, come exactly from the fact that the majority is left-handed. Yeah, and that, that, that is why that, that is why this problem exists. If it was if, 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 if it wasn't true, that the, the problem of uh, of uh, absorbing and, and catering to, to, to so, 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 so that, 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 that the issue wouldn't be there in the majority. Okay, okay. Uh, that, that, I, I, I have a couple of questions on the causation and correlation, but, but they are basically the power. Okay. I, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I only got like, I got a little bit of that. Can you uh, just, yeah, can restate the the questions? Yeah, okay. The first question is about uh, about uh, phone stems and about about words with FL in them, etc. Whether it is whether any, there are any regularities across language groups in this. Yep. Yeah, so for the for the first question, yeah. So this is definitely uh, the notion of phonostemes and sound symbolism has been explored across various languages. And it is, it's really fascinating that it's actually some languages are are more and less sound symbolic, right? So there are some languages that are perhaps slightly more arbitrary or conventional than others, right? So this is a dimension. Um, and the examples I'm using are, you know, English is is my first language. So um, so those were just the examples that 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 I've been using. But this is something that has been found in um in in multiple languages, this idea of, of phonos themes and sound symbolism. Um, what was your second question? Uh, the second question was about triangular inequality, and you said that in dimensions higher than three, uh, uh, the, the relations of words being near points being near in space is not transitive. Right. So, uh, so I think um, for people who are, who are who are not familiar with embeddings. Um, Right, so embeddings are obviously they tend to be uh, you know a hundred or more dimensions. Um, and one thing I think is really fascinating is just because a word, so word A, is close to word B, um, and word A is close to word C, it doesn't necessarily mean that C and B are also close. But right, that so is it, not true. But that is not true because because you have triangular inequality, you have. We have distance between A and C is not large is is not larger than sum of distances between A and B and B and C. Otherwise, it is not distance. Are are you so are you saying it's be, because of the measure because of cosine? What, what whatever measure you use, if it is if it is to if it is distance, it, it must satisfy the axioms of distance. And one of the axioms of distance is triangular inequality. Oh, mm -hmm. I see. 
but well, what what I think is actually the case that in higher dimensional space, very typically, if you have A, B, and B, C, the distance between A and C is close to the sum of the distances, actually, but it cannot be larger. Never can okay. be larger. Okay. So there is a. Well, but, 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 well, yes. Yeah. There's, there's a very nice video uh, by Sri Blue and Brown about uh, 10 dimensional spaces, um, about like a sphere in a multi dimensional cube uh, and how it can never reach the corners, but uh, can be larger. Right. Okay. Whatever. Yeah. So, no, no, I'm not saying like you're right or whatever, but I think this issue is, is a very, very interesting one. And um, I think it's not a moment to sort of. Um, like this is not something where 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 you know this is this is a classic situation where we have to like you're wrong or you're wrong or whatever. But so I think it actually is a situation that is indeed in the whole field not really clearly spelled out. There is this kind of habit that we use cosine distance, right. um, and we have this discussion like among other collaborators. Like I have this question all the time: Why cosine distance? Um, why not some other distance? Um, and so that is sort of something which uh, seems to be related to the issue that you were raising. Um, so we were measuring angles, so to drive that home, but not actually the length of the vector. Right. And so that is a really interesting uh, kind of notion because there is the assumption that the length sort of is arbitrary, doesn't play a role or whatever. Uh, but then there is probably subject to discussion. I think that is sort of something where I think taking out of this discussion, uh, both for the applied mathematicians in the area and for the domain experts, this is something that needs to be solved and needs to, this is a moment where culture, social science, humanities needs applied math in the same right. way that yeah. you can't do genetics without applied math. And, and I think that is a sort of, in five years, this will be a completely different discussion because what we're questioning ourselves here in a triangle Will be textbook knowledge because somebody has solved it for us and explained it in the right, way. <laughs> no, I no, thank, no, no. I, I, I really appreciate that. I mean, that really. There's also, and I, if you could send me that paper you were talking about, because there's, this reminds me of another paper that's basically, it kind of exploring why is it that embeddings tend to be useful up to a few hundred or so dimensions, right? Mm -hmm. And so one, one assumption that we might make is oh well that's just that's just the way culture is or that's the way text is um you know but another thing that i and i don't I, you know this is a paper that that i read um that sounds very similar which is that basically up to a certain number of dimensions um co cosine becomes you know it just doesn't provide any enough information because all the points are are functionally the same distance <laughs> Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, I think this is, yeah, so this is, this is useful, uh, of the, the, this paper. I think that's, uh, something that we, uh, we need to know is that, are we, is this just something that is about the spaces that we're using to represent these data or, or is this something about what we're, what we're representing? <laughs> yeah, no, this is very useful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mike's third question was more directed at me, I guess, with the right-handedness and left-handedness. Uh, I like to put it like I'm both handed. I suffer from that mm -hmm. condition. And uh, <laughs> so there's very few things where you actually have to make a decision in life. One is using scissors simply for the fact that wherever you go, there's a scissor for right handed people. And if it's a lousy scissor, it doesn't simply doesn't work with the left hand. And so, yeah, you could say there is a slight disadvantage, but it's not the disadvantage uh, that Cicero was talking about. I think he was like talking about some kind of innate thing and not some kind of conventionalized. Uh, a coercion that is uh, sort of done by uh, factories that produce scissors. <laughs> and so I think that is sort of something, probably a question we'll never solve. I would like to uh, move on to Mar. Mar. Hello, uh, thank you for your talk, very inspiring. Uh, well, I, I am an artist and I do artistic research in latent spaces of AI models. And I'm very interested in your kind of explanation of meaning making and the meaning of the words and how to calculate between. And my question was about um, if you can reflect a little bit of in your knowledge of um, these kind of uh, distances of words and how you calculate it and the meaning, uh, the multidimensional meanings of words. Um, 
how do you think that the language, the large language models, um, they are carrying this meaning that is so multidimensional? And I mean, related to your your studies. I mean, I know that maybe you didn't publish something about this in particular. But... Uh, can, yeah. Can you can you re restate your question? Um, yeah. Basically, uh, with with your knowledge. Um, uh, how do you think that these large language models like uh, ChatGPT mm -hmm. or GPT-4, they are carrying the, the meanings of these words when they are trained? And um, all this that you explain about the, um, all the studies that you do in the meaning, um, how, if, if you think how percentage of this meaning they, they are managed to, to reproduce or to mm -hmm. kind of uh, acquire, or if they are, like in many authors, they say that they carry the form, but not the meaning. Um, um, yeah, I mean, no. just like I have advantage that you, I have someone who has a lot of knowledge and, and that's something that I taught in my PhD. I know it's a little bit off, but no, but, no, uh, I guess. absolutely. <laughs> um, no, this is, I mean, obviously this is like, uh, you know, ev everyone in my life is talking about this. <laughs> um, I mean, I uh, I think one of the one of the difficulties about that is the fact that uh, these these organizations aren't actually releasing, for instance, the model architecture. Um, they're they're not even telling us what they're training the models on. Um, so we can only so we can really only speculate um, about uh, what they're doing. And presumably, it's just you know they're they're taking a, a transformer like Bert and they're you know. Um, so that's the sort of basic infrastructure I'm assuming. Um, in terms of like whether or not they're actually getting at the meaning, I think this is something, and perhaps this is just a little bit of the slipperiness with which we talk about it, is I feel like they don't, they represent the meaning from the form, but the reason that they're, that we're able, so we're able to sort of uh, see the meaning that comes out and interpret it because we're, we are the meaning makers. Right. And so, mm -hmm. and, and they used meaning makers to create the representation. Right. So in terms of it actually having the meaning, right. They're really just, there are patterns in the way that we use language precisely because we use language because of the meanings. Right. And they're summarizing those patterns and then they're producing something that is meaningful, but it's only meaningful to us who understand those patterns. Right. So it's, uh, so I think there's a bit of slipperiness um, uh, in, in that regard. And I don't know if it's, um, you know, I know some of the people, for instance, who uh, like um, uh, Emily Bender, who would say that it only represents the form. I mean, I would, I would agree with them that that's by definition, that's precisely what's happening is they were, they're only getting access to the form. And when you inter interact with chat GPT, there's no intention, right. On the part of the 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 language model it's it's all just probabilistic it's saying this is you know what i assume is most likely in this particular context given the words that i've seen um uh, so yeah so yes yeah. so was there so, yeah, yeah oh, i'm getting i'm getting some feedback sorry <laughs> that was me no 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 it, it, it is it is interesting your 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 point i mean um I, I will almost agree with everything like um yeah, just like uh, I wanted to to get some hints from you. Maybe you you kind of like um, had some other vision or something, and and you kind of have your argument. No, oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks yeah. for the question. Yeah, thank you very much. I have I don't know if the we still have time. We're we're like um, it's uh, we have basically seven, thirty seven minutes to go. But I have one lot of you know sort of like a provocative question maybe. So you are. Um, uh, you're interested in the meaning of words or in word meaning using these word embeddings as a proxy um, in relation to the body. So if you take this to an extreme, what is like one could understand perhaps meaning that is nonverbal, that is not the word, but there is some other form of meaning. Like uh, to the, the example that comes to mind, Master Duchamp and it starts his white box with the comment that with the comments that. The orgasm is the four-dimensional object par excellence, which means it doesn't have three dimensions. It's not an object, it's an experience. 
And as such, whatever you use to describe it will not repeat the whole thing. You can imagine a restaurant uh, visit with your favorite food and including all the stuff that is involved there is a similar thing. So in some sense, what you're uh, doing in your uh, definitions or what you try to get close to is sort of something where there is a residue of that bodily experience in the words mm -hmm. uh, and where at the other extreme is the full simulation of the event. And that is quite interesting because in neural science, you know, there's a theory of like uh, you, you basically, the difference between perception and action is like you have your gate closed or open basically. Um, so there is these kind of notions of perhaps getting closer to a sort of like fully embodied meaning where these word embeddings are just a really bad proxy, uh, just some kind of encoding we use to communicate. So the question is, are you, are you sort of curious about that sort of like more, um, you know, what, what would be the 100% version of meaning if we could measure this, which we probably cannot. So, 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 so what, what is missing? And you're like, like, are you are you getting curious about like what meaning actually is beyond words? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I, yes, I think I think I think about that all the time. That on one hand, I'm just fascinated that embeddings can do the things that they can do. That they can seem to present sort of in, intuitive findings, right? Uh, I think that's super fascinating. But at the same time, I think what it is, is it's it's always exactly what you said, a kind of residue, which I think is always memory, right? It's mm -hmm. always in the past. Um, it's always what became prior, you know, it's, it's, it's always kind of at a schematic level, you know, and without that sort of richness and immediacy. And I, yeah, I think, I think if it fundamentally is, is about time uh, that if, if we really want to understand meaning, we have to get to this sort of this sort of immediacy of uh, I forgot the 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 word right. So this this sort of immediacy of experience um, um, that you know lots of uh, phenomenologists and and uh, psychologists have talked about like Dewey. And I think right, yeah, I think it, fundamentally, if we want to understand meaning, it's there. And when we're using things like in, embeddings, and honestly, a lot of a lot of what we do in social science, we're we're always looking into the past in a sense. Um, you know, when we're asking people questions on surveys, we're, they're often sort of reminiscing, you know, they're thinking about their past. And so we're getting we're getting the past. And, you know, when we're studying texts, I mean, even the texts that I'm using, you know, they're like five years old um, and, and so on. I think, uh, yeah, I think that's, you know, in, in it, regardless of the fact that we're also missing the modality when we just focus on word embeddings, right? We're, we're certainly missing feeling, we're missing um, hearing and we're missing sight and, and taste and touch, sorry. So, but I do know that people have been working on multimodal embeddings. I don't know if that's gonna get us closer to, you know, the, the, the meaning 100% or not, um, but, uh, but that's, I don't know, that's not really an answer, more of a, <laughs> just a thought on it, but it's a really, it's an interesting question. Nice. Thank you very much. Um, so we should probably continue because this is a highly, highly fascinating topic, phonetic similarities of song in writers. Um, so I had a friend who uh, was, had a project doing the Gettysburg Address, giving it in little chunks to people letting the word being replaced with words that have the same prosody and the result was hilarious. So I assume you get to a similar issue here. So I'm, uh, I'm, no, that's, I'm looking <laughs> forward. <laughs> no, that's uh, okay. That's, that's really, that's really fascinating. So this is again, um, a, an early, um, an early project that, that I've been working on. So, you know, um, oops. Um, but it's here. Here is where I'm. I'm starting to move into this idea of, of phonos themes a bit, um, and thinking about ways that we can use these techniques to think about not just words, but thinking in terms of, of phonemes. So, um, so this builds on lots of literature that that sort of focuses on American popular music because it's relatively easy to study. There, there tends to be good, consistent data. And a lot of work that has looked on change in American popular music has mostly focused on uh, not really on songs a lot. Um, you know, like 30 years of it has just focused on artists and artists change in different artists. And then 
um, some work has started to look at musical features like <laughs> um, and I'm really interested in like trying to get at the fact that when songwriters pick a, a word for the for the, their, their lyrics they're not just thinking about the meaning of the word they really are thinking at that level of of the, the 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 that that phoneme that phoneme level right what is the does this does this sound right in this moment is it conveying the right kind of meaning so really focusing on this idea that that when songwriters are putting together um, words they really are tapping into phonos themes um, so my my data um, I take uh, 50 years from the Billboard Weekly Hot 100 so this is the the 100 most popular songs. Technically, it's not just songs in the United States, um, but the vast majority of them are artists based in the United States. Um, and so I was able to get most of um, the, the, so there's over 270,000 weeks, and this reduced to about 22,000 unique songs. So 50 years, I was really surprised that there were only 22,000 unique songs. Um, and then from them, I... I got lyrics from Song Genius. And so Song Genius is a website that sort of people who are passionate will post lyrics and then annotate it. Um, so it's one of the various places online to get lyrics. Um, and then what I want to do is basically take the idea of embeddings and create a, a sort of sound space, a phonetic space. And so what I do is I convert the words into a phonetic alphabet. And this phonetic alphabet has been sort of the foundation of uh, speech recognition software. So oftentimes, speech recognition will first convert to these phonetic alphabets um, before um, sort of uh, converting to actual, the words that it thinks that they are. Um, and then just create embeddings using sort of phonetic co-occurrences in the same way that we have used word co-occurrences. Uh, and then the next step is basically using a, um, a method to sort of compare songs based on their distributions over these, um, these uh, different phonetic vectors. So word movers distance is, is what I use, which is, base, which is basically earth movers distance. Um, so the first step is to transliterate the songs into a phonetic alphabet. So here I'm using ARPABET, which is one of the oldest um, uh, phonetic alphabets. And so here's an example of, of a lyric. So you can see what it looks like. So each space is a sort of way of getting at a, a particular uh, phoneme. So you can kind of, it's kind of hard to read, but um, it's a way of sort of representing the individual phonemes that is sort of consistent. And it also allows us to compare um, songs that are, you know, even in other languages. So trying to convert to this, um, certainly we lose a little bit of uh, accuracy in terms of um, how a particular artist might um, pronounce a particular word. Um, so obviously there, there are different accents and dialects and, and languages. So the way that they um, pronounce it. This is uh, their alphabet is going to be an approximation of that pronunciation. Um, and then, yep. So I train embeddings using the alphabet phonemes, um, and then this creates our sort of multi-dimensional phonetic space. And then finally, each song is then represented as essentially a cloud of points in that phonetic space. So all the different phonemes. Um, <clears throat> And then we measure the distance of essentially moving one cloud of songs to another cloud of songs. Um, so what is the, the distance? And here we're using cosine distance. So it is sort of transforming those two songs into one and each other. And again, I use word movers distance for that. So this gets us a song by song um, similarity. But then what I do is I create a moving window of two weeks before a song is on the um, the uh, the Billboard Hot 100 and two weeks after, and then minus the song. So if the song shows up in those weeks, I don't include it in its own similarity. So I basically take the average similarity to all other songs, phonetic similarity to all other songs within that moving window. Um, and so basically, when I map the similarities over time of that sort of moving monthly window, we see that song similarity has been increasing. <clears throat> so songs in the in the in the 70s and 80s were less phonetically similar again to the songs nearby. 
um, than they are now. So we're basically see uh, a lot of the same sort of phonetic uh, patterns going on um, in the in the songs on the Billboard Hot 100 in recent years, recent decades. <clears throat> So, uh, so I was really interested in just thinking about the role of the writer and the writers um, in, in sort of their selection and when they're sort of putting together the songs, are they playing some kind of a role? Is there something about the, the songwriters themselves and the structure of, the, of, of songwriters that might uh, relate to this growing phonetic similarity over time? So I explore four different questions. So one, and, and these are just going to be basic associations, so no modeling yet. So one is I just look at the number of unique writers. Um, you know, are we seeing fewer writers today um, than we did in the past? Um, are we seeing a, a more or less average number of songwriters per song? Um, does the number of writers on a song predict how similar it is, again, within that window? And then does it matter if the songwriters are more central or less central in the overall sort of writing network? So, so first I was somewhat surprised to find that song, there's actually more songwriters are on the Billboard Hot 100 um, than they were in the past. So um, almost, almost double um, what they were in the, in the early decades. So we're seeing this increase in the number of songwriters overall. Um, and then I was also interested right, in the, if there was a relationship between the number of, of, of songwriters per song and the overall similarity. So I actually found again, sort of contrary to what we'd assume about teams and collaboration, that songs that have more songwriters are more similar within that moving window. So the, the group of people are sort of selecting songs that all sound the same, right? They're sort of phonetically very, very similar. Um, <clears throat> oops. Oh yeah, so we're seeing that, okay, so yeah, this one is a, uh, uh, we are seeing songs with more and more writers um, just by date. And we see that there is an association between songwriters and phonetic similarity. So this is capped at 10 writers. So there are, there are just a few songs that have more than 10 uh, writers credits, um, but we do see a general association between that phonetic similarity and the number of writers on the song. So if there are more writers, they're actually more phonetically similar to the songs within that weekly, that monthly window. So then I was also interested in just kind of exploring, well, does it have something to do with the centrality of the authors? So it could be that, certain, that very central authors um, or songwriters are um, sort of driving the similarity. So it's just a few people who are building these sort of collaborations. Um, so we can see here that it's a, the, the overall songwriting network has a very strong core periphery, uh, core periphery structure. Um, you see a, a tiny, a tiny little bit um, to the right of a, uh, uh, another group for me, but for the most part, it's a very centrally um, uh, uh, organized graph. So <clears throat> this is a relationship between uh, phonetic similarity and, and the songwriters are the average degree of songwriters um, on the song. So their phonetic similarities, uh, right, are again within that monthly window are increasing with the overall degree of the writers. So basically the more central writers are in the network, the more likely that they're sort of selecting, um, you know, phonemes that are, that are very similar within that monthly window. And so then finally, I was interested in the overall range of the writers, um, and the relationship between that and this phonetic similarity. So <clears throat> are people who are, uh, if, if they are collaborating with people who have, um, are, are all recently on the Billboard Hot 100 or never on the Hot 100, or are they collaborating with people who have been on the Hot 100 for a very long time? Um, so what I did is I subset the corpus to only songs with uh, multiple credits, multiple writer credits. Um, and then I basically, their age starts when they were first appeared on the billboard. And then I just take the, the difference between the earliest and the latest to see if there's sort of an age um, situation between that and phonetic similarity, <clears throat> right? And so I find here that, yes, if there's sort of collaborations are, um, and this is in days. <laughs> so if the writer credits on the songs are, um, very, uh, very distant, we see more similarity. So people are collaborating with people who have been on the, the billboard um, much earlier. So we're seeing, um, so if a newer artist 
um, works with or a newer songwriter works with a, a veteran songwriter, they're selecting these these uh, songs that are very phonetically similar. And that's that's sort of the summary of that one. Like I said, it's a it's a very early in sort of exploring this idea of uh, of a of a phonetic space and trying to get at um, the sort of meanings of phonemes. Uh, right now, right meaning is very much uh, backgrounded in that particular um, uh, in that particular project. But I'm hoping to sort of, uh, elaborate more on this on this notion of phonos themes using this particular method. But that's uh, that's that project. <laughs> nice. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, this is something which um, I would love to um, uh, perhaps discuss a, a little uh, further um, yeah. and ask the first question. So I had a student a couple of years ago who looked at the Billboard uh, top songs over again over several decades, but only like the very top and just uh, drawing a spectrogram of those. It's rather depressing what you see since 2007. It seems like it's the same song, basically. And um, so there is, seems to be this sort of like narrowing going on. It's almost like the system sort of like calculates the eigenvector of Billboard 100 and then you end up with this one static thing. But yeah. at the same time, and this is not a question, there is uh, things like, you know, Eminem being interviewed by 60 Minutes, uh, where he says like, people say nothing rhymes with orange, and then he goes on. <laughs> <And> <laughs> You kind of uh, you kind of uh, alphabet kind of uh, transcription sort of like uh, in the face of the way he a spells orange and b spells words differently so they actually fit with orange and it perfectly makes sense. You're just like, yeah, that's awesome. So you have the same trajectory in music in general, where you have these sort of quenching going on, like same compression algorithms, auto tune, like all that kind of stuff. Uh, sort of like mainstream music becoming more boring, while at the same time, we definitely live in a bifurcation of like music has never been that varied and that awesome. So how do you, how, how do you tackle this? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, I think, yeah. So one of the, one of the reasons that the Billboard Hot 100 is just easy to study is precisely because it's been, you know, you have this sort of well-constructed data set of general popularity um, but one thing I'm really interested in is 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 using the the really nice uh, complements of you have you have sort of text analysis you have this sort of measure of popularity and then you also have a, a way of accessing the networks of songwriters and I think that's one thing that I'm trying to get into is mm -hmm. really thinking about the networks of songwriters and starting to write so we have the basic picture of yeah similarity phonetic similarity is increasing. Um, but what about what what explains innovation? Like what explains people who are doing interesting things in this particular space, despite the fact that it's overwhelmingly right the same? Um, and, you know, and 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 I'm hoping that we can look at the the network of collaborations itself to to see if we're um, if if we're seeing uh, you know if that can give us any any ideas of what sort of uh, uh, you know. Yeah, what what sort of structures might create uh, those those spots of innovation, and where exactly is innovation coming from? But again, this is sort of this is an early, and I'm I'm still in the process of of building the 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 data set. So um, I don't know. <laughs> nice, Mark Mays. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I I wanted to. So yeah, I have also like. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Can. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the I have a couple of questions. So I will begin with the shorter one. The, the you used the uh, alphabet. You didn't use the international phonetic al alphabet. Is there like a technical reason, uh, just because of what the you know letters it uses? Or... Um. Yeah. I. It was. Uh, it. It. It was simply because it was easier <laughs> at, the, at the time. But my 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 plan is to use a, a variety of phonetic um, sort of phonetic alphabets to to make sure that it's not just a sort of uh, you know um, some sort of a, a an effect of using ARPABET. Um, but yeah, it was just at the time it was a little easier to use ARPABET and it's a little faster. <laughs> yeah, okay. makes sense. Yes. The, but the main question was so so you if you uh, looked at the change of the sort of the phonetic phonetic similarities across the uh, sort of 
across months across time then what will we well we've done something similar with the sort of sentence embeddings and then it's like of course it really depends on the you know what is the unit that you look to compare it uh, like months wise or year wise right so it's like within so, so as i understood you you mostly like convert it uh the same phonetic variability like within one month and in comparison with last months, right sorry say, say that again that you looked at the phonetic variability like within the same months right right yeah That's, and yeah. just yeah so i removed the the focal song and then what was the average similarity to all songs yes. within that moving window that moving monthly window yeah but but this uh, uh, average change over uh, this phonetic similarity across the years but did you also look at the yearly change so from year to did you look something like from year to year how much did it change i mean like uh, so it's the one year's um, if you come Pair all of these embeddings of one year to the last year? Like, uh, how does their like cosine and distance change across time? Mm -hmm. Do you look something like that? Yeah, that's a that's a really great idea. Now, I haven't I okay. I um I know that I need to look at different time windows and kind of see how that affects them. Um, and it's definitely a plan. But right now, yeah, I was just thinking that a monthly window seemed kind of the the most sense, um, just in terms of, you know, if you're listening to music and and you're thinking about um, what tends to be, you know, in the, in the world around you for a particular month. Like that's kind of where my mind was at the time. Does it feel like I'm in a bubble of similarity, but no, definitely. I, I plan to look at sort of, yeah, I'll, I, I planned to, to, to mess around with the time window and see how that changes things. Definitely. Yeah, it, it's a lot of different claims to make in the end, but it's interesting. As a case. Yeah. Thanks. Mike has a question. Uh, yeah, I have uh, half question, half comment. Uh, one thing I wanted to to point out that 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 we have a three or four months ago. You can you can find it in a website. The guy from ICL was talking about the um, history of the the, the sort of re, uh, finding revolutions in. Uh, in uh, well, in cultural data, in temporal cultural data, and in particular in music, and he was actually looking at uh, uh, basically yes, in some sense similarity of songs, but but more longitudinally in, in a way like Mark suggested, like comparing what is changing year to year, and 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 there are some very dramatic events happening there. Uh, and I just wanted to mention it because I think it might be interesting for you to look at this uh, yeah, to, to, to compare because it is really different things. And one thing which I wanted to ask slash comment slash, I'm a little bit troubled, to be honest, by this idea of every, uh, measuring average time distance of everything to everything, yes? If you have a structured, I mean, some people, well, probably I, I, I'm not very much into contemporary music, but uh, I suppose that there are people who are listening, I don't know, rap, and some people who are listening something like, which is like pop music, and some people who are listening mm -hmm. something else. And yeah. these are different domains, and, and the question of uh, sort of, uh, can, uh, Concentrating it, it into into one single uh, measure, how far away it is from from average values, like you know, measuring the uh, mm -hmm. average temperature in a hospital, and, and uh, yeah. doesn't tell you much. Oh. Yeah, no, that's a that's a really really good comment. It's definitely like uh, before I can really move on, I need to to do that. I have a this is and maybe maybe you all could help me with this i have um a very large data set of songs um that has genres and then i have my data set which has a lot of information but for whatever reason it doesn't yet have genres i haven't found a good way of 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 collecting the genre so, you know the various apis that i was using just for whatever reason didn't they have things that approximate a genre but they don't quite have it but I do have a massive data set of songs uh, uh, that does have that. It has records. It has it has the record labels, 
um, and it does have the the genres that they're sort of classified in. And so the the question is is trying to to merge those and match them. And so previously, <laughs> I had been um, using um, right. So I've been using these APIs where I can search for songs and then I can collect like the first few songs, and then I basically use edit distance between them to to figure out which one is the right song um, based on the the search engine on Song Genius, for instance, which one it, it gave me back. The problem I have now is that I, I have this this data set of twenty thousand songs and this data set of I want to say it's like fifteen million, and the song titles are the same for a very small like maybe a quarter of them, they actually have perfect matches. So those are easy to match. Um, but some of them are are, are not, um, you know, they're, they're not exactly the same song titles, right? So some song titles have like a subtitle and maybe it's there, it's not, or they have just these slight differences in how they're, they're used. And so to use edit distance on that, right, would re require this like, you know, com comparing every, uh, um, every song title in my large database to every song title in my smaller database, right? Measuring the edit distance between them and then sort of assigning the ones that are the closest. Um, but of course that's like, you know, computationally pretty ridiculous to have all of those pairwise comparisons. So I'm trying to come up with a, a, a more efficient or what's the most efficient way of doing it. Um, but that's where, yeah. So this is basically, I need to, I need to do this um, because you're absolutely right that it's probably, um, I need to control for for genre in some way before I can, you know, make any um, uh, strong claims about comparing averages across all of them. I think without the actual song data, like the recording data, this will be really hard. Um, I, I maybe like here's an anecdote from private life in. In Dallas, Fort Worth, there is a record store that buys all the estate uh, sales of people and puts them in a huge record store. It's massive. I don't want to name a name because what I'm going to say is not very favorable. <laughs> um, so you walk in, it feels like the size of an Ikea or like a big Whole Foods market. And there is basically two main genres. It's uh, rock on the right and R&B on the left. Mm -hmm. And R&B has everything that is done by people of color. Mm -hmm. And rock has everything that's done by white people. <laughs> and if you ask people at the cashier and say, okay, where would I find Donna Summer and Georgia Moroder, left or right? They don't have an answer. And I think that is sort of like the key issue. Uh, there, there is genres which are heavily enculturated and conventionalized in a very dominant manner. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Led Zeppelin clusters together with some Bach fugues in a PCA, if you have the actual audio recording and people should not have, should jump over there, whatever their enculturation is to listen to both because they will have fun with both. And so I think the whole genre question needs to be put into question. You can easily see this if you look at like the same song and different recordings of it. You know, the mm -hmm. Gulf of Ipanema has 400 mm -hmm. cover versions um, that are probably published and probably 4,000 cover versions that are unofficial. You find them in every genre. Mm -hmm. and, and so what, what's the genre of that song? Is it bossa nova? Yeah, and totally not. And so this is like, I think, a very important issue. Like if we do these kind of uh analyses and all we have is metadata then we will have a very hard time because uh by necessity our analysis will be just as biased as the metadata it's the same way you can't do a history of paintings without looking at paintings you, mm -hmm. if you want to do a history of music you need to look actually listen to the music and i think that is a really really difficult issue which uh, i do understand like given the data we have it's really really difficult because you know if you've got discogs and that's it then that's it and um, if you got, you know, I think that is sort of like the key issue. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that in, tw in 30 years, the music genres of the second half of the 20th century in the English speaking world and German speaking world, which is sort of dependent on that, but, you know, they will be put into question. And they're, they're, they're sort of like become more ridiculous the closer we go to them, basically. Right. Right? So, right. Yeah. And so this is not a solution for your problem, I guess, but maybe, 
a call to action that we need to listen more to music recordings. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, um, this was, um, I don't know, if, is there any more questions in the audience? Um, Dustin, you want to say something at the end? Uh, no, I mean, I just, you know, thank you. Uh, like I said, these are these are two sort of uh, uh, working projects in a, in a little raw. So, I mean, I really appreciate uh, all the comments because, you know, it, un unlike, a, a, unlike a project that's towards the end where you don't want to change it, right? This is precisely where I'm at, where I'm like, oh, these are really great ideas. So, um, you know, I just, I appreciate the invitation and taking the time to to listen to, to, to what I'm working on. And I really appreciate your thoughts. And um, if you have any other thoughts about it, you know, uh, I welcome emails or we can set a one-on-one -on -one Zoom and, and chat. You know, I love talking about this stuff. Yes, thank you very much. So I would like to do what I always do. Like, let's thank the speakers. Thank you very much. And also, I would like to point to the next uh, iteration of the Kudan Open Lab Seminar, which is in two weeks, on April, uh, April 3. And uh, this will be Ana Clemente. And uh, very fittingly, so we're on a roll here with a gradient of really interesting stuff that sort of fits together. Her topic will be hedonic evaluation of multisensory objects. Mm. So we're very much looking forward to that. Um, and... Um, Please watch what has been there on the web. We now have several seasons on YouTube. Um, and greetings to everybody who has not participated but seen this online. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.